I'm delighted uh, to be here with you, and it's great to see so many uh, come out this evening. Um, I have participated in theology uh, on tap as a bishop uh, for 11 years in Kentucky, different venues down there, always somewhere where there was a tap. Uh, and, uh, but it, it's been exciting for me. I was just, just interviewed and I said that it's, it's energizing uh, to be with you and to hear, um, for me primarily, what are some of the things you're wondering about? What would you like to hear me address? Um, what uh, observations do you have that would help me be uh, the shepherd here in this diocese? So we did advertise a topic and I'm going to address that. I, I hope it would be um, somewhat interesting. But for me, I, I basically know what I'm going to say. I have no idea what you're <laughs> going to ask. Or and that's, that's what, what makes this exciting and a real pleasure. So first of all, I thank you. Thank you for responding and, and making time in your life to come out to this program tonight. And I, I'm sure a number, I know a number of you came a distance. Um, not everybody is just local here in the, the Harrisburg area. So a special thanks to you. And I'm sure some of you go also to the, the Lancaster program, uh, the Theology on Tap there. But I, it's great to kick off the program tonight. And I'm, I'm really excited to be with you. So again, thank you. I'm going to talk for you know, 25 or so minutes. And, and then, as I said, for me, the most interesting part Am I doing that? Uh -huh. uh, I, I'd really like to be down there, but I think we can't because of the feedback on the speaker. So there's a little, little distance here, but um, we'll make the best of it. Um, so uh, the topic that we, um, you know, I wanted to get something that had to do with um, a, a substantive topic. Um, and I don't think we get, get much more uh, basic than talking a little bit about Jesus and ourselves. And so what came to me when I was asked to frame a topic for this evening is that question that we're all very familiar with. Um, Jesus asks his friends in a very special place called Caesarea Philippi. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the three synoptic gospels. Who do people say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? But I thought of it in a, a novel way, or at least the way I had not thought of it before. Jesus asks us, who do you say that I am? But then I think we could also say, we ask Jesus, who do you, Lord, say that I am? It's kind of turning the tables a little bit. So those are the two parts of my little talk that I'd like to dwell on with you for a while, and then just open it up. And, and whatever you might want to say or question, or make observations, doesn't have to be at all related to my talk, so uh, please feel free, just whatever you'd like to say or, or ask or comment on, do that. So as I said, all three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in their Gospels, have this scene pretty much in the middle of their Gospels, so you even get by the way each of the evangelists form the material that they give us about Jesus in his public life, it's, it's pretty much at the center of the content. So this obviously is seen as a pivotal point, or something that's axial, something that's a critical moment in our Lord's public ministry. And he's got his friends there, and he asks, who do people say that I am? And what's the word on the street? So he's sort of asking for, we might call today, a, a poll or a survey. You know, what, what, what are they saying? How am I coming across? What are they thinking? How are they trying to interpret or understand me? And, and you know the answers are, well, they, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're uh, Isaiah, or one of the prophets. Huh? Uh, the people could only think in terms of the past when it came to trying to figure out this Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we already know in the Gospels the people were saying, who in the world is this? Huh? There are a lot of questions like that. Um, who is it that the sea and the wind obey? Who is this man? Who is this one who teaches with such authority? He's not like our other teachers or the rabbis that we know. He's, he's very different. When he speaks, there's something that rings true in the bottom of my heart when I hear his words. So they've already been asking this, who is he? And now Jesus himself poses the question, what are they saying? And so he's, he's one of the great prophets. And that in itself is high praise, huh? Because God used the prophets to speak to his people. 
Uh, he used the prophets to challenge and try to change the people to be more faithful to God's covenant love. And so to say that Jesus was one of the prophets come back is a pretty uh, high praise for Jesus. That's, that's a high esteem in which they would hold him. But what we, what we learn, of course, is that those past categories, prophets from old, are not adequate to understand Jesus Christ. In Jesus, the Father is doing something absolutely novel, absolutely new and different. And so he can't be understood by past categories, at least not as they were understood. And so Jesus then takes this whole thing a one step further. He doesn't say, what are the others saying? But he asks the question that comes down through the centuries, and it's a question that you have to answer as well as myself. And that is, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And we know the story in all three Gospels. Peter is the one who speaks up. I can see myself there in the crowd trying, making sure I didn't have eye contact with Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm looking down and looking up at this guy, just so he doesn't see me and I see him, because I don't want to answer that question. That's uncomfortable. It's a lot easier to say what others are saying about Jesus than to profess what I believe about Jesus. It's easier to quote some author, easier to quote the catechism, easier to quote the Bible, rather than saying, from my heart, this is who Jesus is. Now Peter makes an answer that gets a high compliment from Jesus, but the point is that Peter didn't figure it out on his own either, did he? Um, Jesus says to him, well, uh, well done, Simon, son of John, um, uh, but what you've just said has come to you from my Father. In other words, to really understand Jesus, it can't be done in the categories of the past, nor can it be done simply by our human intellect or human wisdom or understanding. Grace, some help, some assistance, some direct intervention, as it were, from God, who wants us to come to faith in Jesus, is necessary. So we don't figure it out on our own. And, and Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, uh, because the Father has revealed this to you. It's, it's a, so faith in Jesus isn't something we work up to. It's the gift that we receive because God loves us and he wants us to come to faith in his incarnate son. That's the first part of the equation here. Who, who is Jesus? And we've come through reflection and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our, in our church to say, Jesus is the eternal son of the Father from all time, a part of the blessed Trinity, who at some point in time, through the yes of his mother, the Virgin Mary, took on our flesh. And so the absolutely new thing that God wanted to do was enabled by the Mary saying, let what you have said be done to me. I, I consent, don't understand it, no idea how this is gonna unfold, but I trust God and I will say my yes. And Mary does. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary and the Son of God, the eternal Son of the Father, the, third, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, becomes incarnate, enters human history by the power of God the Holy Spirit. And it's taken a long time for the church through a number of councils and very wise and graced people to come to be able to articulate that mystery of what does it mean that uh, the Word was made flesh. But it, that answer we can give on a theological level and we can say yes, through the councils we know that Jesus is true God and true man. Perfect humanity and perfect divinity. He's one divine person with two natures. All, all, of, all, all of those things that have developed in our theology. But it really comes down, when push comes to shove, when we get to the bottom line, who do you say? And we don't answer that just with our words. That's a question that has to be answered with our lives doesn't matter just what I say about Jesus, 
but I say who he is by the conduct of my life. He is either Lord or he's not the Lord of my life. He's not the Lord on a Sunday, but not Monday through Saturday. He either is or he isn't. And so that critical question that our Lord asked his friends, he asks us and we answer. Every human person answers that question. And they answer it by the choices they make and the way we live, we live our lives. Who do we say that he is? So as I said though, I thought what's interesting if we kind of used our imagination and turn the tables and say, okay, Jesus, we know you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And that, of course, those two things together were shocking. Uh, and that's why Jesus in those stories, in the synoptics, says, don't tell anybody. Because he would fulfill this category of the past, this expectation. Someone was going to come, right? The prophets had come, and it had been a couple hundred years since God raised up a prophet. So again, that was high compliment to say that Jesus was one of the prophets. They hadn't had a prophet in Israel for a very long time. But to say that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, would mean that he was a figure of glory and power. And Jesus had to then tell them, and right after, in the Synoptic Gospels, what do we find that Jesus tells them the first prediction of his passion? Because he's going to be a very surprising kind of a Messiah. Not the Messiah who first exhibits power and glory, but the Messiah who walks a path of suffering and death and then becomes the glorious Messiah. That's something that they could not comprehend. And even though in all the Gospels he tells them three times this is what must happen, um, it, it kind of goes over their heads until they experience it. And finally, until they all receive the revelation from the Father and the Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that's why we call that the birthday of the church. It is the birth of the community of believers because now they can place their faith and their trust in Jesus, not because they've concluded it in their own minds and hearts, but they have been given that grace, that power of the Holy Spirit, which we too receive in confirmation. And that happens to us. Pentecost happens again every time the church celebrates confirmation. And we're sealed in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And we can say, Jesus, you are Lord. And then the challenge is to live the answer that we give with our lips. So back to the idea of now saying to Jesus, OK, here's who you are. Now, Lord, who do you say that we are? Yeah. Who do you, Jesus, say that I am? What does God want you to see when you look in a mirror? What does he want you to see? And I think, um, just to comment a little bit about that, there are a number of uh, things we can go to uh, scripture where uh, God tells us who we are. If we don't get the human person right, if we don't understand ourselves, our own dignity, the sacredness of our own life, we don't get anything else right. We certainly don't get any of the moral teachings of scripture or our church right if we don't understand who we are, who Jesus tells us that we are. When we have a correct understanding of who I am as a person, what God sees when he looks at me, then all of the moral teachings really fall into place. The best definition of morality I've, I've ever heard, and I use it all the time when I'm speaking on moral issues, is that morality is what we ought to do because of who we are. It, it, it's not some external norm that I have to conform to, but rather morality is making external my internal dignity. If this is who I am in God's eyes, then this is how I ought to behave. So who are we in the eyes of God? Well, the very first thing we learn about us uh, from the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 verse 27, is that you and I have been made in the image and likeness of God. Now that in itself if we reflect on that, is an amazing truth about you. You are in your body and soul an image of Almighty God. 
He has made us all in his image and likeness. Let us make him in our image and likeness, male and female. Let us create them. I remember when I was being taught early on in my grade school and high school, this idea of being made in God's image was primarily, at least as I recall it, I don't want to uh, cast it in a negative way, but as I recall being taught that we were made in the image and likeness of God, it primarily had to do that since God is supreme intellect and supreme will, you know, absolute intellect, absolute will, that, that the fact that the human person has an intellect and a will is primarily what it means to be made in God's image and likeness. And it was pretty much the way it was understood, at least as I, my early catechesis, as I, as I recall it. We have an image and a will because we're made in the image and likeness of the supreme mind and the supreme deliberative power, the supreme will, which is God, the divine will, the divine mind. There's something much more substantive, though, biblically speaking, about being made in the image and likeness of God. But we only can understand it through the revelation of Jesus Christ, because he taught us that our God doesn't live in this splendid, solitary um, existence as a supreme deity, but rather our God lives in a divine community, three equal persons, um, uh, and from all eternity, uncreated, the Father giving everything but fatherhood to the Son, the Son and Father being such a perfect relationship, the Son perfectly giving and receiving from the Father, that that relationship itself becomes the third person of the Trinity. And so the truth that we learn about the image and likeness of God in himself is that he is a trinity of persons, constantly giving and receiving within the Godhead in this community, this family, you might say, this divine family of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We wouldn't know that. No philosopher would ever conclude that that was the essence of it, that was the interior life of our God. It's only by way of revelation, Jesus talking about his Father, Jesus being the Son of God, and Jesus talking about their Holy Spirit. And so that's a, a, an amazing revelation that we come to through the gospel and through the, the teachings of, of our Savior. And so for you and I to be made in the image and likeness of God means that we are essentially made for relationship. Huh? That's what God is, an eternal relationship of the three persons. And so, um, you know, what the Greek philosophers called, well, man is a social animal, the human being is made for society, we're relational. It's explained in its ultimate truth by the revelation of the Trinity. If we're in God's image and likeness, then we're made for relationship. First of all, and foremost, the relationship with our God, and then secondly, relationship with, with others. Um, it's where we find our true happiness. It's, it's where we find our fulfillment. Now, just as the Trinity is always our giving, ex extending from themselves to the other and receiving, so too we only find our true fullness in self-giving. If we're made in the image and likeness of this God, then, then we cannot be an isolated being and find our full fulfillment, but rather uh, our highest effort is, is to give myself uh, in an act of selfless giving. And so to try to live in isolation, to try to live apart from others, to be self-seeking and self-serving and self-centered is self-destructive because it goes contrary to our very essence, the very reason that we've been created in the image and likeness of God. And we see that all over the place. We see people who are trying just to grab as much as they can for themselves in whatever way they wish and it's self-destructive. It will not ever raise us up to uh, the fullness, the full potential of being a human person. Huh? To say that we're made in the image of likeness of God, and, and I know that you've heard a lot in, uh, of the, the wonderful uh, legacy that St. John Paul has given to the church and what those, those uh, many talks that he gave at the Wednesday audiences that are now called the theology of the body, he had a phrase that I, I love to repeat and he said, you know, the human person is theographic. 
your theographic, look at the word theos, the Greek word for God, graphane is the word to write. Right? God is written in the human person. That's, that's what it means to be made in the image and the likeness of God. Our sacredness, our dignity comes from the fact that you are theographic. Now what's the opposite of theographic? Pornographic. To pervert, to twist, to change the divine image and likeness that is in myself. To distort it in such a way that I become not self-giving, but self-destructive. And that word pornographic um, is certainly um, uh, descriptive of someone who is not living in the fullness of, of why they were created. Uh, we, are, we are theographic and to live up to that dignity and to behave according to that theographic reality is to be a moral person. Um, there's a difference between saying that the human person is a unity of body and soul and the human person is a union of body and soul. And I would say that one of the greatest problems I see, at least in today, is that most people think, if they agree they have a soul at all, is that they are a union. Right? Somehow they're put together but they're side by side in a sense that, yes, they make me up. I have a body and I have a soul, but they are not necessarily integrated. And so what I do with my body doesn't necessarily affect my soul. I can do what I wish with my physical self, and I can say that I'm still a very spiritual person. I want my soul to somehow be happy and be in grace and be with God. But we don't believe that we're a union of body and soul. We believe we're a unity of body and soul. The human person is such a way that our soul animates or vivifies my physical presence, and my physical presence compenetrates my soul. These are inseparable realities of myself. And someday, or at death, they are separated. Um, and our soul goes on, but there will come a time when they are reunited. A glorified body will be uh, restored to uh, our, our uh, immortal soul and, and will be in eternity, in one of two possibilities in all eternity, uh, as a whole person again, a glorified body and, and a soul. So it makes a big difference how you think of the relationship between your body and your soul. And our church tells us we are a union Physically, what happens to our physical presence, our body, affects our spiritual reality or that vivifying principle that we call our soul and vice versa. Finally, I think from that story in Genesis about who are we, we ask Jesus, who do you say that I am? Uh, there is a unity of body and soul. And then Genesis goes on to talk about a unity of two. Right, that beautiful line uh, when God puts Adam to sleep and he takes from him a rib and he constructs the proper companion. All of the animals, all of creation up to that point was an inadequate companion for the man. And so God fashions the woman. And when Adam wakes up and he looks at Eve, he says, at last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He recognizes Eve, something he could not recognize in the rest of creation. And all of those, he remember he had named all the animals. That was his prerogative to show that he had authority over the rest of creation. But when he looks at Eve, he sees another eye, another person, another subject, not just for his use, but to truly be at his side, since she came from his side, as a true companion. He sees another eye, the only other one at that time in all of creation. And, and so what we learn from about the human person is that, is that in, in the relationship between the man and the woman, there is an even fuller, a more complete uh, icon of the image and likeness of God. The man and the woman reflect 
something unique in their own persons and in their physicality, their differences reflect the image and likeness of God. And when the two become one, as the book of Genesis says, we have a fuller or more perfect image here on earth of the truth of the image and likeness of God. So those are just some of the things I, I, I sort of almost maybe seem like random thoughts. But I, I think at each one of those points that I tried to make really are critical for uh, our culture today, for the world in which we live, because they're not understood. They're not understood. People don't see that when they look in a mirror. And so part of our purpose of evangelizing, part of the purpose of the church and your life and your witness uh, is to help others understand who Jesus is, but understand too who they are. And we can only do that a certain amount by words, but primarily by example, by living according to our own dignity, uh, living as an image and likeness of God, expressing uh, our theographic self to the world around us, which should invite others to want that same happiness, uh, to want that same fullness. How about if we stop there?